afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Sustainable Certification Platform uh, webinar, which we're hosting in partnership with the Ecosystems Knowledge Network. My name is Sean Sherry. I'm from DEFRA, and I'm going to be chairing the session until our close at about half past two. Um, I can see the uh, attendee list is increasing, and it's really great to have a brilliant mix of participants from across the UK, public, private, third, and academic sectors, as well as some international colleagues as well. And we'd be delighted to have the opportunity to demonstrate the Landfit Typology tool, which is part of our um, SIP platform, which um, Professor Michael Winter will um, provide you a bit more of an introduction of shortly. Um, that will be followed by an overview from Professor Jack Crosby from the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology to explain how the tool works and, and followed by a demonstration. Before I hand over, let me just explain what's going to happen. So um, Professor Windsor and Professor Crosby will speak for a total of about 50 minutes, and then we'll use the rest of our time for questions and comments. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Michael Windsor. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's good to talk this through. I'm delighted to uh, be here. We're going to uh, have a, a little kind of overview of SIP first, but the main purpose will be Jack in a minute talking about the tool. But just Briefly, sustainable certification, uh, that's about investigating ways to increase farm productivity whilst reducing environmental impacts and enhancing ecosystem services. So that's what we've been trying to do, and the tool is an important part of that objective. But the project itself was, was much bigger. We had a four and a half million pound program from DEF for over three, three and a half years. Uh, farm scale work with lots of work on agricultural interventions. You'll see some of those mentioned later by Jack, and then at the landscape scale as well. Uh, which is uh, where this particular tool fits. So really trying to work out how we scale up from farm change uh, to landscape change. Multidisciplinarity has been at the heart of what we've done in SIP, uh, ecological, agricultural, social sciences, economics. So that's what it's all about in the broad terms. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the platform. Timetable. We've worked in uh, seven study areas. Uh, again, Jack will be mentioning some of these shortly where we've trialled out the tool. Uh, but we chose study areas that were well-researched landscapes, uh, and in five of the seven with well-researched farms. So we're trying to build on what had gone before, uh, trying to add value to, to existing research and what we were doing in SIP. Uh, that's just uh, the range of uh, partners involved. You'll see that uh, it's not just academic uh, and research institutions. We have uh, we have industry-based uh, people, LEAF. Uh, we have environmental NGOs like RSPB. From the very start, we wanted to engage uh, with users, engage with people who had on on the ground practical uh, experience with some of these issues. So we've all worked together. Uh, most of the time in a very happy team, uh, and uh, I hope the outputs are good. And the output you're going to hear about now, because it's one of several, of course, is the typology tool. Uh, and so I'm going to hand over to Jack. The results of a long project. Um, there were two parts to it. Uh, SIP1 was actually on-farm working, uh, where the participants in the program were trying to develop new um, for sustainable intensification and how to apply them locally at the farm. But a big part of what we were trying to do for DEFRA and Welsh Gov and the program was to the way of looking at broader landscapes beyond just the farm sense of one individual in terms of what could be done and how it could be achieved. So we're looking, as the title says, for opportunities and risk for farming in the environment at a, at a landscape scale. And certainly from the landscape scale, the implication there are, is that it's going to be used for helping to develop new policy about how future management of farm and food production could be implemented uh, in the UK. Particularly interesting now, perhaps, in the light of post-EU um, ideas about what it might look like. So the real information challenge in developing a landscape topology uh, is really about landscapes that have similar agricultural potential and are similar in terms of environmental, social, and economic values that we're trying to conserve or protect or increase at the same time we're striving for food security. And if we can identify areas on the landscape that have these similarities, then that's what we're referring to as landscape topologies. I hope I don't get into too much jargon as we're going through, but that's really what we're trying to help define in this. In particular, we're looking for national coverage for policy and planning, um, but we'd also like this tool to be useful at a very local or regional level, so for stakeholder engagement in various parts of the country, if we could get information from these data sets to help them as well. 
Um, and right down to the very farm level. So once, we, once we've decided or once someone has decided what's a good thing to be doing in a large landscape region, we hope that we tools out of this that would go right down to where and how that would be implemented at the farm level. So quite a range uh, that we're trying to cover in developing this topology. Um, I'm going to walk you through real quickly just the, the uh, conceptual approach to what we're doing, and I'll come back to this slide several times as I walk through the talk just to sort of remind you where we are in the process. Um, basically, the question is how do you target, and spatially now, where on the landscape uh, would we provide engagement and support for farm uptake of strategies for sustainable intensification that deliver preferred outcomes with respect to the environment, to society, and to the economy? So the first thing we have to actually do is outcomes we're after. Um, so the first map really represents the tool that I'll come back and describe later, the interactive tool. But the very first step is to decide what is it in terms of environmental, social, and economic outcomes that we're trying to either preserve as we intensify production or maybe improve even as we're intensifying production. So it's a question of both conservation uh, and, and perhaps some remediation as well. But this, uh, this map that we're looking at in terms of where the opportunities are in the landscape will be made up of weighted environmental, social, and economic data. And the weighted is the important part because this first step, what is it that's of value on the landscape that we're trying to protect, can be a very personal or a very uh, group-specific kind of a definition. Certainly different um, stakeholders have different ideas of what the most important values are. So in developing this of, of targets that we're trying to preserve. We wanted this particular aspect of the tool to be interactive, that we could take it out into the different areas, we could talk to people about what they valued, what they preferred, and then find a way of recording that with an evidence chain to support exactly what their final conclusions are. So the first step is this specifying the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. The second thing that we have to be concerned with is basically what can you do? Um, given that there are a number of sustainable intensification or actions that you could implement, just where on the landscape would you do what? Obviously, all intensification actions wouldn't be applicable everywhere. And the second step is sort of a function of what the current farming enterprise structure is like across the landscape. But also, there's a bit there about what the attitude of farmers and stakeholders are. Would you want to do that, even if you could do that? So understanding farm attributes and whether or not a particular uh, intensification strategy would be relevant is all part of producing a map of where you can do something. That's the second part that we'll look at in the toolkit. And the third part in the toolkit is well, if you're going to do something, if you're trying to achieve something, you want to avoid bad mistakes, if you will, or you want to promote a win-win situation. So we have to understand the relationship, the influence of a particular intensification strategy for greater production. What, how does it influence one of the outcomes that we've set as one of our priorities? So this matrix, this relationship between a strategy and whether it affects positively or negatively, or perhaps it's just neutral, with respect to what we're trying to preserve or conserve in the, in the environment is an important aspect of what goes into this. So if we can specify these three things, if we know we have things we want to achieve in terms of outcomes, and if we know we have a strategy map so we know where we can do what, and if we add to that the information that certain of these things would have positive effects and certain might have negative, if we put all that together, we should be able to produce a priority map to show places where sustainable intensification is likely to produce uh, increased production, but also would protect or conserve the other values that we're after. So the national map is there. You can begin to drill down through and look for regional outcomes and, and even local outcomes in terms of the types of practices that can be involved. So this was the challenge, what we're trying to do, how to bring together those kinds of existing databases and that knowledge. And the toolkit that we developed to do this really consists of about three parts. Um, as I sort of showed on my diagram, the three steps to getting there is you select what you want for outcomes, you prioritize the sustainable intensification actions that you want, and then you need something to guide your in implementation when you actually do that on the ground. So within the landscape topology of SIP2, um, the first step, the dynamic topology tool, which is what we're about launching today, this is about enabling the users to set priorities, uh, to specify their preferences and assign weights for different outcomes in terms of environmental, social, uh, and economic well-being in the landscape. 
That's an interactive tool. It's web-based, and um, I'll actually demonstrate that after the talk today for those of you that want to stay over for an extra 15 or 20 minutes. It is up and available, and we'll give you the link to that uh, later in the talk so that you can try it out for yourself. And uh, it's a beta version running at the moment, and we will be finalizing it in the next couple of months as the project completes. So once you've decided what the map of outcomes, where your priorities are, the second thing is, well, what will we implement then? Which of all of the different uh, sustainable intensive actions can we do where? Uh, it fits in with what we're trying to protect. It fits in with what we can currently do on the landscape. This is a static topology tool, and this is a spreadsheet-based tool, but it enables the user to see what practices the outcomes that you've set up by using the dynamic tool. It brings up a, a sort of a priority ranking of things you should try in any particular area on the map. And then finally, um, once you've decided that there's a range of things you could do or you've selected a priority uh, uh, strategy that you will try to implement, actually how you do that on the ground in a field uh, is important. And so we've developed several tools that work locally with farmers so that if you're looking to establish habitats or if you're looking to sort of create buffer streams on rivers, uh, these very GIS-based, very small-scale um, implementation tools will help to try to translate the policy ranking and priorities into action on the ground. So that's the toolkit we've put together. And what I want to do is walk you through the three pieces of this very quickly, just to give you a feeling for some of the complexity and some of the data that's behind it. So we'll start again with that first um, bit, uh, the dynamic topology tool, which is all about allowing users to, to plan outcomes on the landscape using environmental economic data. Um, when the project started, uh, together with DEFRA and Welsh Government, we defined some some indicators of economic, environmental, and social well-being, um, things that you want to either improve or avoid. Uh, and, and these are very broad definitions, as you can see by looking at the slots. So one of the things we had to do during the project was see if there are data sets available that actually measure or uh, can be related to these particular sets of outcomes. Um, I won't spend too much time reading through them all. We've sort of grouped them together in what we're called the three pillars, the economic, social, and environmental pillars. Uh, but something like biodiversity, for instance, exactly, that, that's a desirable outcome. We'd like to preserve, protect, or, but how would we measure that on the detail? So for each one of these 23 indicators that were developed, uh, we had to start assembling uh, data sets to un underpin the definition of what's there. So for the 23 indicators, in the end, we ended up with over 100 spatially explicit data sets that go towards what that definition of biodiversity is. In the particular slide that's there, you can look and see, and this is not all that's underlying biodiversity, it's all I could fit on my slide, but every a measure of biodiversity can be plant diversity, it could be habitat diversity, there could even be an air quality measurement in there because we know, for instance, that ammonia exceedance might be related to the persistence of some rare species. So any kind of data set that relates to the particular outcome uh, could be included in a definition of biodiversity. One of the things that we tried to do in developing this tool, and the reason we made it an interactive tool, is that not everybody would agree what a good definition of something like biodiversity is. Some people might want to put more weight on um, mammalian species. Some others might just want to worry about habitat creation. Others may be more concerned about aquatic biodiversity. So each one of these data sets, when it's put into the final definition of biodiversity, can be weighted by the user when they're doing this construction. Um, you can turn something completely off and say it's not important. You could even, in, in the future, you can add new data sets as they become available. One of the constraints that we went through, because we're doing this at a national scale, uh, the little bullets there show what we did. These all had to be national scale data. We had to all get them into a common data structure. Um, because some of these things, some of the data that were collected through something like the farmer surveys, uh, there's confidentiality requirements that we have to uh, represent, but we do want the data to be publicly accessible to the degree that they can be. Of course, they should have direct elements, relevance to the outcomes. Uh, building on existing standards, and, and when we talk about composite functionality, I said out of word jargon, but I apologize for that. Really what we mean is that a lot of these data sets can actually be used across many different measures. Um, again, ammonia exceedance might be related to biodiversity of rare species, but it might also be related to the air quality outcome that we're trying as well. So uh, trying to come up with a clearly objective kind of a single definition is difficult, 
but that the importance of the tool is that whatever you choose and however you weight the outcome in defining these indicators, it's been documented in the tool. So there's a clear evidence chain backwards about how this particular preference was established. So what we end up doing when we finish with this is we have our 23 indicators um, and we have a map of high and low values of those indicators for each one individually um, across the, uh, the, the landscape of England and Wales, which we were considering. So for each one of those, there, you, you can look at some of these maps very briefly and see that in certain areas where one value is high, other areas are low. Uh, some places that there would be trade-offs that would occur like that. By trying to improve something, you might damage something that's already good there. So we have to somehow combine these 23 separate indicators into some overall measure of possibility for outcome. And the slide that I'm showing right now is, is actually uh, how these data sets can begin to be combined come up with qualitative and spatially suggestive ideas about how these three very different economic, social, and environmental data sets how they might complement each other. On this particular slide, um, for each of the economic, social, and environmental indicators, I've added all seven or eight under each one individually. And of course, you can look at this and see the places where environmental indicators suggest there's a lot of value to be protected don't necessarily coincide with areas where economic concerns may be of more importance. And then in the very end, we can combine all three of those very high-level pillars into one final measure of indicators, that map in the upper left-hand corner. So for each 10 kilometer square on England and Wales, that color represents some sort of a combination of opportunity. Uh, if the opportunity is low, that means maybe there's only one or two things there that are really going to coincide with successful implementation of, of, of SI practices. The darker the color indicates there are more and more things there that would be protected or need to be protected as we look at what's going on. So this kind of a map is what we're trying to produce. Uh, and it, as I said, producing it is really a matter of uh, social intercourse, if you will. It's getting people together to understand what it is they value and reaching some sort of a compromise because frequently these things will be in conflict with each other. And this is where the dynamic topology tool comes in. Um, it's uh, an interactive, uh, runs in your web browser on your computer. As I said, we'll have a demonstration at the end of, of the talk. But what you're allowed to do in the tool and what you're encouraged to do in the tool is to go in, open it up, and for each one of those uh, environmental, social, or economic levels, there are slider bars there from left to right. And turning it left means I'm not interested in that at all. The weight of that goes to zero. Pulling it to the right raises the weight higher. So you can go through and look at what you are trying to produce a map of, what type of outcome opportunity is it you're trying to look at. Um, under the three pillars that we were doing in SIP2, um, you could just say, well, let's just look at an environmental map. So you could actually put the weight on social and, and economic completely to zero and see where the greatest environmental opportunity is. So this is the kind of thing we encourage people to do, and we took this around to several workshops, which I'll discuss a little bit later, engaging people at local levels, and as you would imagine, in different parts of the country, there are different preferences for what particular aspects of uh, this landscape and, and well-being is, is important to them. So in addition to the high-level descriptions, um, like biodiversity or air quality, uh, as I mentioned earlier, those indicators are all underlain by a number of individual data sets. In the case of air quality, there's seven or eight data sets that are currently in the tool available. By clicking on that and opening it up, you can then see each of the individual data and you can uh, slide those weights back and forth as well. So if you don't think something like particulates is an important aspect of air quality, you can turn the weight off to zero. If you think ozone is the most important, you could put the weight on ozone very high. So the actual definition of what these outcomes are is sort of adjustable by the users and the people that are dealing with the model at any one time. Uh, at that level, when you're down dealing with the individual data sets that we put into it, um, we've documented this, the, the data themselves. They're all transparent and accessible. If you click on the information tab on the tool, it'll give you a little text box that tells you where the data came from, the documents, the metadata, it describes how they're used in this particular definition. And it'll show you that small inset map at the up. That is the map of just particulate distributions in air quality across the UK. So looking at that and looking at the overall outcome large map on the left, you can perhaps begin to understand how that particular data set or that particular quality is contributing to the overall outcomes 
that you're setting up in your discussions. Um, we also have um, published all of these indicator values in archive. Um, it's available in a, a PDF, and when, when we finish up with the whole project, all these documents will be available. So um, there's a lot of information that went into to providing this, and sometimes it's just easier to go look it up in the table rather than just to do the interactive work. But the online tool is there, and it's all documented. So next step, now that we sort of mapped along with our people that we've been talking to and our, if we know what we're trying to achieve, what tools do we have available that we can try to implement to improve, increase, intensify production, and yet still maintain these outcomes that we've just mapped? So we'll talk a little bit about how to develop a suitability map for the different sustainable intensification practices that we're trying to implement. So there are also 23, I'm not sure why the number 23 kept coming up, but there were 23 high level strategies that were identified for us to consider. And obviously, again, these can be expanded. Um, and you see that we can roughly group them as crops, livestock, or sort of farm finance infrastructure kinds of things. And under each one of these, just as under each one of the outcomes, intensifying crops or crop improvement, there are a whole number of individual actions that can be undertaken, but these are sort of groupings or generic types of strategies that could be employed across the landscape. So these, again, as I said, um, we could add more to this as we go along, but this covers a pretty broad spectrum of what we could currently do, uh, perhaps with respect to sustainable intensification. So how do we know where we can do these individual um, actions? Well, the first thing, what is the capacity across the landscape for uptake of these strategies? To do a particular increase in efficiency of milking parlors or to start doing crop precision farming of some sort, you need to know where the farms are, where the structures are, what the enterprise is, uh, the farming enterprise is, and where they're distributed on the landscape. Uh, if you're looking at primarily dairy enterprise, that's distributed differently than sheep and upland grazing, for instance. So depending upon whether or not you're going to try one of these strategies, you first have to know what the current farm structure is, what do we have in place that will allow it, and how much capacity is in place? Is it just one or two farms, or are there lots of farms in certain areas? So the first bit being capacity. The second bit is um, potential to, to actually take up these results. Now, most farmers really aren't going to go out and do anything unless there's some uh, economic incentive. So assuming that there's a program in place that will support this, there's still other decisions that farmers will consider in terms of whether or not to do this. So for each one of the sustainable intensification practices, uh, the vertical line coming down, so crop conservation tillage, for instance, there are all uh, considerations that a farmer might look at, which is the left-hand column on the side. Does this have any benefit? Uh, will it um, benefit my lifestyle? The ones that I've highlighted on the left are, does it increase management? Does it require new skill? Does it increase complexity? And does it increase risk? So if you were considering to do something like crop conservation tillage, some practice related to that, the intersection of those two red boxes show you that in terms of crop conservation tillage, it will increase your management requirement. That's a green. It will increase or require new skill. It will increase complexity, but maybe that's not quite as, uh, because it's slightly lighter green, not quite so much um, a, a definite. Uh, and it will increase risk. That's a red. No, it probably won't increase risk. So this kind of an idea of how a farmer would make a decision, even if he had the capacity to take something up, is represented here. These were filled out through a whole series of farmer workshops, through farmer surveys, information extracted from the, the Farm Business Survey. Uh, it's sort of an expert opinion box right now. And the number included under each one of those um, matrix elements is really not the intensity of the result, but is a measure of how confident the expert and uh, opinion is. So a very low number says, yeah, we think that might be a positive aspect, but, but we're not real sure. A very large number says, yes, we definitely know that crop conservation tillage would increase risk. So these are the way we're trying to combine both qualitative expert knowledge along with some very definite spatial distributions of where the capacity are. And if you put those two things together, if you know what the current structure is and where it is on the landscape, and whether or not a farm enterprise or a farmer might actually participate in some of these things, uh, you can produce these maps. So for each of the 23 sustainable intensification strategies, 
and we have a map that shows where you might go do it. Um, the colors on the map are sort of a relative scale, so uh, this is not trying to pick a particular one at the moment. We're just mapping each one individually on on the on the uh, on the landscape. Um, just like for the outcomes, if you lived in a particular region of England or Wales, you could look at this map and you can say, well, there's a high likelihood that we might do this, a low likelihood we might do that. So there will be a whole mix of possibilities of sustainable intensification strategies, many of which might be good for your local area, some of which would be bad and you'd want to avoid. So what we'd have to do in the end is then decide, well, which one can I do? I can do these things. It's within the capability of my farm enterprise and it's not going to put me at great risk. And this is where we come to the last bit. This is really what sustainable intensification is all about. Just because you can do it and it doesn't put your farm at risk, would you do it given that you're also trying to consider these broader environmental, social, and economic outcomes. And that's where this strategy outcome influence comes in. If there are a range of intensification practices you could implement, pick the ones that actually have positive effects on what it is in your area you're trying to protect in terms of outcomes, and avoid the ones that would have a negative influence on things that you've said are important in your local environment. So if you combine these three pieces together, um, you'll get this map. But first, I just want to speak briefly to what this matrix looks like. And this is another expert opinion matrix. This is a lot of what SIP did through the three years of the project. In this particular case, along the top, um, sort of written vertically, are 23 intensification strategies. And going down the left-hand side of the plot are the outcomes that we're actually trying to promote, increased production, decreased loss, waste, efficiency, and then the environmental qualities, and then also the social qualities as well, down to cultural value at the very bottom. And again, based on interviews and based on workshops and based on uh, just expert review of the literature, we've been able to assign a positive, a negative, or a neutral kind of relationship for each set of interactions that appear. One thing to really notice here is that after three years of study, there's not a lot of gray area there that has zero. We think it's neutral, but we don't have much confidence that that's the case. In many cases, the responses of certain of these indicators to these strategies just hasn't been explored. We don't really know what's going on. But for others, we do have a good space to, to, to try to estimate what the effect would be. And again, the numbers in this matrix represent confidence based on evidence chains. And all those evidence chains are documented in this. So to go see where a three in a particular square came from, we'd have that backed up in our reports and we'd be able to show you the results that produce that. So putting all three of them together, we finally end up with what we're trying to achieve through this whole thing, some sort of a priority map for delivering sustainable intensification practice. Um, uh, these can be regional opportunities or these can be sort of a national map targeting areas. And what these things actually look like would be something like this. For any square on the map, you could go in to the static topology the, the, that's been developed, the priority tools, and of the 23 um, sustainable intensification strategies that are available, it'll rank those within each one of the grids across the landscape. So the top one being what you should most likely do that would have high impact on improving uh, agricultural production and would have low impact on the environmental, social, or economic uh, value that you're trying to protect. Um, I'll come back to some of these in a minute because some of them that come to the top, as you'll see, something like nutrient efficiency and habitat creation, that's generally good anywhere on the landscape. And so that does tend to come high in lots of different, uh, in lots of different areas. But certain other things like integrated crop protection or crop conservation tillage, that might be high in arable areas, but you would expect on a, uh, a grid cell that would be someplace up in the mountains of Wales, you might find that they would be lower down in terms of priority just because of the enterprise and the, and the, and the structure that's available. So we can rank these, these strategies across the landscape. We can also then do what we set out to do in the topology. We can start to cluster these things together. So instead of ending up with just a, a very colorful speckled map, we can use statistical techniques on each one of these grids to try to find areas that are similar. Um, in the map on the left, we've chosen nine zones. Now there's some of, notice that not all the zones are contiguous. Some of the blue zones are some down south and some maybe over in Wales. But the whole point would be that the analysis of this really is about what you're trying to achieve in going on. 
at a very large scale, uh, you might want to look at maybe up to 50 or 60 zones. Try to find the very local kinds of relationships that are available from combining all these data sets. So the thing about these engagement areas are the statistical techniques produce them that they have similar outcome needs, they have similar farm structures, and we added in this particular case a limited travel distance. I mean, if you're going to get farmers to collaborate and work together and learn how they're doing things, that's going to be easier if they can drive down the road 20 miles instead of having to move all the way across the country. But if you can identify areas that are similar on different parts of the country, and in some of those areas you've actually done some work on SI, you know what the benefits are, you know what the pitfalls are, someplace else which hasn't begun yet, by using these uh, topologies, you could maybe transfer that knowledge across and say, we had success, we're like you in many ways, so we think this is something you should explore in terms of what you're about uh, in terms of further intensification in your area. So clustering is about knowledge extrapolation, if you will. It's about scaling up from all the individual data sets to large regions that seem to have similar possibilities and potential. The other thing that we can do is, is basically, uh, it's not clustering per se, but it's just a ranking idea. So in this particular case, what we're doing is just saying we have limited resources. We're not going to be able to consider all of the strategies. So if we look at just what is a ranking, so the upper right map on this slide that says first, in that particular map, in every square on England and Wales, we've plotted what is first in terms of the strategy that comes to the top when you apply this tool at a national level. And as you can see, there's really only two colors on that map. There's a green color, which is basically habitat creation, and a slightly gray color, which is really nutrient efficiency. And those are obvious things that we could do everywhere. So the map brings that up. And maybe that's a validation of the map, and maybe that's just a duh. We should have known that anyway. Nonetheless, it is something fair. The point of this map is that if you only can afford to support two types of activities, if you did habitat creation, and in this particular case, uh, nutrient efficiency, could be the broadest area that actually might benefit from those policies because those rank near the top in terms of priority in pretty much all the areas. As you start to move down to the second most important thing, you add a few more things. As you move down to the third most important strategy, the map starts to be speckled because once you get out of the two or three things that seem to work very well everywhere, now what you would do in terms of a strategy becomes very locally dependent on what the local enterprise is like, what the local environmental conditions are like, so trying to establish a range of values, this might help you pick the two or three ones that would have the best and most effective immediate benefit with others to follow with further programs. So that's the national picture of what we did with the map. Um, I, I, we'll come back to questions in a minute. I hope you guys are writing some notes down as we go along because there are lots of questions here. I'm sure we haven't thought of everything. But I do know that from the workshops we've had as we've moved around with SIP, um, the national map is a very interesting exercise, but, but we always, in the, in the local workshops, start talking to farmers and farm advisors and conservationists and Rivers Trust, and they said, well, how can we use this locally? What is it about that that actually helps us to do our jobs a little bit better? So I'd like to spend just two or three slides to talk a little bit about what you can do on a more local level with this particular kind of tool. So the, the topology provides flexibility for local groups. As we've talked about to start with, using the dynamic topology tool, you can sit down and, and change ideas about what's important. You can set your local priorities and preferences. And sometimes what we found is just that aspect of trying to understand how what I prefer and what I would like to value in the environment, I can see how that conflicts with some economic value that someone else has as an important part of their um, lifestyle and, and quality of, of well-being. So the, the, the initial part of selecting outcomes locally opens a dialogue, um, gets things out in the open, and as we've said before, using the tool to do this, the actual underlying assumptions of why that comes up as important are then documented in the tool itself. Once you select something in terms of a set of outcomes, you then run the topology tool, the static tool, to decide what are the possible options that you could then implement locally in terms of sustainable intensification actions. 
And in that particular case, uh, this is an iterative kind of a process. The dynamic tool runs immediately. You get a new set of inputs. You can feed that into the topology tool. So if what comes up to the top says, well, this is not something that we really would like to do in terms of intensification, you can do a little bit of a sensitivity analysis. Go back and change your outcomes. See if, you, if there's other things you prefer to protect and see what happens then in terms of possible sustainable intensification practices that would come up. Just the iterative process of trying to understand trade-offs and win-wins and outcomes and exactly what the limitations or advantages of the different strategy, uh, SI strategies are, this results from working your way through the tool. It helps connect with people, uh, increases citizen engagement. When we've had this out demonstrating this tool, at, again, at these workshops, we've had people from a wide range of interests come in and say, well, that's, you know, that's great. I'd like to sit and play with it a bit, or I hadn't thought about that. So it's worked really well. And lastly, because of this idea of developing topologies, because once we've done this in many places, if we can identify regions, local areas that are similar to others, we can put groups together and have them talk to each other and perhaps share experiences in ways that wouldn't have happened because it's not just across the back farm fence. Um, just to show you a little bit of output from the tool now, um, I won't bore you with this because we could go on looking at outputs forever and ever. But as part of SIP2 and some workshops, Michael talked about the fact that we had several areas where we had um, actual um, research farms in the landscape areas that we were working on. And in each of these areas, we went to, uh, we took the tools and went to uh, visit them in 2016 and 2017. So we had a, had a bit of a development. We went into the areas, talked to the local farmers, and showed them one of the important aspects of this local engagement is to try to show them and, and verify with them, if we could in these workshops, what the outcomes in their areas look like compared to the national averages. In this particular case, just to give you a flavor of the tool, um, the upper left are environmental outcomes, the upper right are economic outcomes, and the lower one is the social outcomes. And this is for the tall catchment. I'm going to go back one slide which is down on the lower left side, it's, it's down on, in the south coast. So in that particular farming community, compared to the national averages, some things seem to line up okay. Biodiversity, air quality, water quality, are all more or less in line with national averages. But greenhouse gases concern in there was a, perhaps larger than the national average. Pollination perhaps less based on the data sets that went in. Going over to look at economic outcomes, again, um, production was more of a concern than waste or loss in that particular area. And the question then we sort of raised at the workshops, is, is this in line with what your understanding is? Uh, and we got feedback from them, and they decided that the weights that we use nationally probably weren't appropriate for their local area, and they picked their own weights in this dynamic tool. And we went away and came back a year later using their weights to repeat the exercise now do you agree with this and see what comes to the top in terms of sustainable intensification strategies? This is again now for the TAW. This is another example of local downscaling. So just to get used to this for a minute, we're now looking at the sustainable intensification strategies. So the, the box on the left are farm and finance strategies, things like soil structure, soil retention, machinery cooperatives. The upper right are crop strategies and the lower right are livestock strategies. Um, and they, on each one of the blocks, uh, there are two bars. Uh, the blue is the tall. This is what came to the top in terms of recommended or priority strategies for that local area. And the orange bar is the average for all of England and Wales. Um, and they're ranked in order from top to bottom with their importance in the tall catchment itself. So as we talked about earlier, you know, basically habitation uh, on the left-hand plot came to the top as being really important. Uh, if you go over to the crop strategies, nutrient efficiency came to the top as being important in TAW, and it was important all across England and Wales. But moving down one in terms of grass improvement, that was relatively more often recommended for the TAW than it was across all of England and Wales. And that probably is consistent with the fact that a lot of lowland TAW is really grazing uh, areas. So you can begin to understand here, maybe now as you move to the second and third and fourth recommendations, how local conditions may begin to differ from what the national policy or the national conditions are representing. And this is a dialogue again, and we're doing things differently. Why aren't they funding us? Why aren't we getting what we want? So opening the dialogue. And then one last real quick look at something that's going on in this process. We did three workshops. 
Um, we did the Taw, uh, we did the Conway, and, and we did the Ellerton project over in the east. And this particular graph, um, I'll give you a moment to get used to it, uh, the upper left set of histograms are for crops, and each one of those is a crop strategic, uh, strategy for intensification. There's four bars on each one. Again, the blue is the average for all of England and Wales. The yellow is for the Wellen, which is over in the east of England. Uh, the light gray is the Taw, which we were just talking about. And the orange one is the Conway catchment, which is up in North Wales. And what we find as we move across these kinds of things is that for certain things like crop and grass nutrient efficiency, that really tall set of four bars on the crop bar, that's good wherever you are. But when you move over to like crop conservation pillage, the three catchments start to differ, the three study areas start to differ a lot in terms of whether that's important locally or not based on local enterprise based on whether or not the, the systems are going to support that particular case. So this is one of the other ways of trying to understand as you scale down locally, whether or not there are consistent winds across the whole landscape or whether certain uh, of the intensification projects will have to be targeted to just certain smaller areas in order to see what's going on. So having sort of done this, worked through the workshops with everybody, we've now come up with a way of looking at national priorities. We can draw clusters of places where we should do things. We can drill down to the local level and start interacting with people on the ground, refining our ideas, trying of three or four possible strategies to come to the top on the national tool. At this local level, we can talk to people about, well, maybe these are more useful because we have other considerations that we have to consider. Um, you finally select the strategy. If it's funded to go do it, how do you then actually go do this on the ground on a farmer field scale? And this last slide is really just to, to demonstrate one particular tool that we've used in this project um, in, our, in our tier one study areas. This is the LUCI tool, the Land Use Capability Index tool. Uh, it's a GIS-based tool. It's, it's, um, it has a resolution down to five meters on a side square, so it can do field scale kinds of analyses for certain of uh, the outcomes that we're looking at. It's environmental outcomes only. There's nothing economic or social in Lucy. But in terms of where you would go do something, if habitat creation came to the top as something you should do in your area, just what kind of habitat creation and just where would you do it to actually get the greatest benefit? So tools like this allow you to go in and look at what's happening. Uh, if you put a connection between two existing bits of forest here, uh, if you put a buffer strip next to a bit of stream there, that might be much more efficient than if you did it some other place on the landscape. So trying to then bring down the recommendations for action to, to have their most uh, beneficial effect uh, or efficient effect on the landscape is what we're trying to do with these tools. Uh, the Lucy tool is actually used in the Conway. Uh, that was one of the case study areas while we were doing SIP2. Uh, Welsh government came up with a series of um, offers of work to be done on the landscape. And a, a group of upland grazer farmers sat down with a SIP tool, looked at what that was recommending, sat down with the Lucy tool and said, well, we could do some of those things here wrote a proposal and to actually go out and do some of this. So we've actually seen in a couple of cases some of this work being translated into action on the ground. So lots of work, an awful lot of stuff that's going on, huge number of technical reports coming out in the next two or three months. Um, but the conclusions in general, I think, basically uh, are, are pretty good. We're using existing data sets. Uh, we can do some prioritization at a national scale. We can do some things that are perhaps more helpful than just documenting where things exist in terms of identifying areas where you can share best practice. Um, it seems to work really well at the advisory and supportive level of farms. Uh, we've gone down and worked with uh, farm advisors and individual farmers in terms of getting uh, practices in place. And it, it also is useful, I think, just in terms of trying to get people to realize that they're not necessarily in the boat by themselves, if you will, that there are other types of things happening that they need to be aware of, or there are other people doing similar things to what they'd like to do, and they could share experiences and successes. Um, and we think this thing will continue to evolve. Basically, all parts of the tool have been set up so that we can add data sets to them uh, with better mapping of economic outcomes. I think that's going to be a really important aspect moving forward. Um, a broad range of practice for SI as well. Again, the ones that we sort of put into the tool to start with were pretty broad and generic, but as we begin to decide what it is 
more particularly that we're trying to achieve in terms of improving uh, the agribusiness, we can include those other strategies in the tool as well. So the the the, um, uh, the webinar today is is about sort of announcing this result. Uh, the reports are being finished in the next couple of months. Um, the tool, the dynamic topology tool, I will make a demonstration of that in a few more minutes after we've had a chance for some questions. But the real question now is what next? We've spent this money, we've developed this, um, it's useful. And so for this, I am going to pass over to the Janimit and ask her what the next steps are. So you can hear me. Um... So, yep, so this is fine. So, very quickly, DEFRA and Welsh Gov, who funded this project, asked the project team to commit for the foreseeable future that this tool would be available to the wider community. And CEH has agreed to do that as part of its national capability remit, uh, which is funded from the Natural Environment Research Council. So, it will be out there, will be all available. But the slide you see before you is also um, just telling you that Wales, at least, is um, taking this forward as part of this uh, much larger um, environmental monitoring and modelling program called AMP, which we hope to get a better acronym, but that's it for the moment. And the whole remit of this program is to do ongoing national monitoring, but also in that red box you'll see that part of the remit is to provide data and modelling tools, particularly for a planning post-Brexit land use, both with respect to regulation and centre schemes. Um, and the outcomes need to be for benefits for people, just as with in the dynamic typology tool, not just environmental, but also economic growth, well-being and health. So we will be developing the dynamic typology tool using the infrastructure that underpins all the data sets and the, a lot of the IT to basically get the resolution down from the current 10K to go to one kilometre resolution, also to retain and update the data for Wales and uh, convert it into an overall data portal. and also and we're working with Welsh Gov to see if we can get a training centre for both um, helping train people up in citizen science and also to get data and models out the door and help people train use these tools. So the idea would be to use the dynamic typology tool to, in, in an early phase to explore land use scenarios for post-EU planning whilst we have an integrated modelling platform. So the project team is over 21 organisations, you'll see everyone around there and if you want to know more about how at least it's being developed further in Wales, please just get in contact. So with that, I'll wrap up and hand back to Bruce uh, Siobhan, I think. Thank you. Okay, oh, thank you very much to um, Michael, Jack and, and Bridget for that. I've, uh, I've seen the tool demonstrated a few times now and it's always really exciting to see what you've been able to achieve in a relatively short amount of time, actually. Um, many thanks to um, everyone who's been sending through their questions. We're going to work through those now, and if you have any more thoughts as we're going through, please um, use the, uh, the chat function to send through your questions. So the first question that we had was from Stefan from the CLA, which says, on the strategy indicator slide, the indicators appear to be ranked, but it also says equal weights on the slide. Are the indicators ranked? Jack, are you able to? Yeah, I'll, um, am I on? Okay, I'm not sure exactly which of the slides you know, you're, you're talking about, Stefan. Um, I will just make the general comment that um, in, in cutting out pictures in my slides, some of the pictures I, or screens got straight off of the tool just set up to show the interface of the tool and weren't necessarily aligned with the run uh, that we were making at the time. So um, uh, the the indicators themselves, the, the strategy indicators, only get ranked once we've run the outcomes through the static topology tool. And there will be a different ranking for each of those strategies in each of the squares on the, on the landscape. Um, so that's just sort of putting the raw bits of data together and coming up with a map that sort of shows what would come to the top in terms of priorities in different areas. The real trick in all of this, of course, is in trying to put that sort of a speckled map together uh, into some sort of a coherent group uh, or geographic region that could be managed. Um, if you change uh, weightings to the outcomes, uh, th there's two levels of 
of that. And I'll demonstrate again later for those that want to hang around a little bit. We can actually fire up the tool and then I'll show you. Given that there's so many outcomes and data sets in there, changing individual data sets has small effects in some places and large effects in others. If you look at the map of England and Wales as a whole and you start changing weights on outcome indicators, uh, the map doesn't seem to change a lot. But if you go to certain areas, you can see large changes. So individual frames can change quite a lot as you locally move preferences from one thing to another. But across the full range of activities in England and Wales, uh, the, the overall map doesn't seem to shift a whole lot. Um, again, I'm not sure I've answered your question particularly, um, but uh, if you, we don't have voice feedback here, so we'll just see, okay? Okay, thank you very much for that one, Jack. Um, our next question is actually from my colleague, Luke Spagavecchia, in the room. So um, I'll hand over to Luke. Thanks, Siobhan, and thanks for a great presentation. It's really interesting to see the tool in action and, and its capabilities. Um, I was just interested, when you were presenting on the dy dynamic typology tool and you looked at this sort of intersection between um, the various measures of sustainable intensification and, and kind of various risk factors, et cetera, I was wondering if those risk factors are geographically uniform or if they vary on a, on a grid basis, um, because clearly some of these risks all vary dependent on sort of soil type, climate, or farm system. In this particular case, these are these are presented from because they're not available uh, spatially. Uh, just by the fact that they're pulled together out of literature surveys, they're pulled together out of small focus groups. Um, so while there's been an attempt in this project and in others to sort of talk to dairy farmers, to talk to arable crop uh, farmers, uh, we don't know exactly where on that landscape is. So this, this risk and benefit uh, idea about what you have to consider on your farm if you're thinking about adopting, that's not spatially explicit. But when you combine that with the structures of the farms, then we begin to feel like we can map it. So in the previous slide, uh, what, we, what we looked at Okay. Am I on? There we go. In the previous slide are the farm structures. So there is, a, there is some information embedded in these matrices about whether uh, a, a beef farmer might consider the same risk that a dairy farmer would. But in, in essence, we're not really able to sort of map not enough information yet. There may come time when we can do that, or we may find other ways to, to do that other than trying to map risk on to enterprise as currently is mapped out there. Okay, thank you very much for that, Zach. Um, and the next question comes from Sarah Jones from Biodiversity International. So we're going to unmute you, Sarah, and ask you to ask the question out loud. Right, let me just find it. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you for the very cool presentation. Um, my question was on, so the rank strategies um, matrix, I wasn't clear on how that's converted into spatial maps, so which data are used to do that, once you the strategies to, to outcomes matrix? Okay, so if, sorry, I'll get a little bit code, let me just back off for a second. Um, when we get to the point that we've ranked this, the strategy, the strategy ranking that we've got here, we get one of these for every square on the map. Um, and uh, that, I haven't shown that here, but basically what we're trying to do is move from the speckled hen kind of approach to the, to the more coherent mapping and clustering. And that's where this topology itself comes in, so that given each square on the map has a certain ranked set of strategies that should be implemented, uh, what we're then trying to do is find all those squares on the map that are contiguous and have very similar strategies coming to the top so that we can get some indication spatial extent of that particular type of uh, enterprise and type of recommended uh, would be. Now, that is a statistical analysis of a number of data sets, and of course you can analyze anything like that a number of different ways, and that's of course what we've tried to emphasize in having this tool so it's, uh, sort of desktop running. Uh, by changing your cluster conditions, by looking instead of five or six or seven clusters, or perhaps a dozen or perhaps three, if the same areas and the same strategies keep sort of coming up together as you vary some of the statistical analysis of it, it sort of suggests that that's a robust result that you should be looking at. So in the tools, when we do these, the, the variable zonation is an important aspect. 
um, if you're trying to make sense of ranked strategies across all 1,700 grids or whatever we've got, uh, again, if you change the clustering algorithms or if you change the requirements that they be within a certain travel distance, if certain areas keep coming together, that's really what we're hoping to get is to move away from the speckled hen map to five or six or seven coherent areas on the landscape that have some sort of a, a coherent strategy uh, built in. Okay, yep, I think that makes sense, thanks. Thank you. Um, so the next question comes from uh, Leanne Jones from the Environment Agency who asks, who is training the farmers to use the tool um, and is there a program in place? Uh, we, we, did a, uh, we did a lot of work on, on this program uh, leaf work with us a whole lot. Um, we had our workshops for, which were with local farmers and we actually had a couple of follow-up knowledge issues workshop farm advisors. Um, I think what we come down to in our, in our experience of running this in workshops in the Conway and, and the other is that we looked at, farmers are very interested in a point, but the course of evolution uh, puts them off just a little bit. I mean, in the end, if they decided locally uh, that this is something to do, it's really the farm and field scale tools that are the things that are of most interest to the farmers. Uh, one step back when we were dealing with groups like the Rivers Trust and the Farm Advisors, they found the tool very useful because, again, there they were able to use the tool to show the number of different farmers they're working with that this is not just your problem, similar problem that others in this region are having. And not only that, there's another region uh, 100 miles away that had a similar problem and did this and it worked. So there, there is a certain scale at which this becomes useful other than pure information exchange. Um, thanks very much for that question, Leanne. If um, you have any sort of follow-on questions about how to use the tool and how you might use it in your work area, feel free to get in touch with um, DEFRA directly. Um, the next question we have is uh, Chris Fairbrother from the South Downs um, National Park Authority. Um, and Chris has asked, in protected landscapes specifically, landscape character is likely to be a significant factor in terms of sensitivity. The tool does seem to consider this within its weightings. What does it use to do this? And does it use national character areas? We do have national character areas in. Um, that is one of the things that does go into the tool. Um, I'm going to try to do a demonstration in, in a little while when we get through the questions. We'll fire it up and I'll be able to open up that landscape character tool and show you the data sets that are currently in there. Okay, excellent. Leanne Jones has just asked another question. Um, she said, is it possible to suggest additional layers which are beneficial to landscape management, such as natural flood management opportunities tools? I, I think so. One of the things we tried to do in developing this is to, it, we, we looked at data standards and sort of conformity so that uh, any, any, any data set that can be put in at the national scale can be used. Now, as Bridget mentioned a moment ago, though, this. Uh, the whole tool set can be downscaled. We're planning on doing something like this for Wales. So when we're not considering the rest of England, we can have a higher, uh, finer resolution in the data sets that go in. Uh, within what we're dealing with now, the current tool does have um, the national flood frequency map information in there. So there, at a national scale of England and Wales, there is flooding information available. And just to add on, CEH are committed to maintaining and making sure it doesn't fall over. We will be adding data sets uh, for Wales, but within England, you know, if, if there is interest in adding more data and, uh, and also the, these training, we just need to talk to DEFRA and other people to identify how we might be able to take it forward. Thanks. And thank you very much. We, we don't have any other questions at the moment, so if uh, you've got any burning questions that you want to ask, please send them through. Um, one of the other things I wanted to touch on was um, accessing the tool. So Jack has said that we can uh, share a link to where it. Yes, and I'm just going to get there. Is my slide still showing? I believe so, yes. Okay, so at the very bottom of the screen, um, below all the logos, it's eip.ceh.ac.uk, apps sustainable intensification info. If you go to that link, what will open will be what we call the landing page. Um, it's a brief, it's a, a website page that describes very briefly the tool, and there's a button on that page that says launch the tool. If you click that button, it'll download into your browser, and as long as your browser is open, you'll be running a local copy of the tool and you can play with it. 
Uh, when you close your browser, you lose it, but you can go back to that website and launch a new version of it whenever you're ready. We were thinking we might try to put that up on the screen for those that do want to hang around. Um, the page itself will be further improved over the last couple of months, the landing page. And if you get final approval of reports and as some of the other documents that come out of the final report are made available, we'll sort of put links to those as well. So in addition to being able to launch the tool, uh, there will at some point in the next couple of months be a copy of the static topology um, spreadsheet available. Um, we will have our reports. We will have our data archives of all the data layers. All that will be available on the page uh, as we move to completion in December. Thank you, Jack. Um, any more questions, people could send them through using the chat function and uh, send to all attendees. Um, we're now at five past two, so we've, uh, you know, we've gone through the first uh, hour of the session. Um, it would be useful as well if people could let us know if there is interest in demonstrating. We could move on to that. Um, Jack and uh, my colleague Bruce are just um, figuring out how to uh, set that up, so you should be able to see the tool and then see it in action. And there's a question here from Mike Render. Whilst this tool is designed for sustainable intensification of agriculture, could it be used to identify potential areas for woodland creation to deliver greatest natural capital? That's the kind of direction we're going for the Welsh Gov project is because the underlying data layers of quality and all of these things, they're, they're, they're there for whatever application. You just need the expert judgment to then convert convert them. 99% of the work was getting the data into the format to make them all talk to each other to get the web interface. So now that's exactly the kind of thing. We'll keep the SI1 as it is, but in terms of Woodland Opportunity or other applications, it's all adjustable to do that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Bridget. I should say Mike is from the Forestry Commission, hence this. <laughs> okay, so I believe we might now move on to Practical demonstration. Yeah. I'm going to move over to a different computer because we're trying to share live, and uh, so I'll have to move to give us two minutes while I move to to Bruce's computer. Um. Oh, I believe there was another question about um, if there were any plans for Lucy to become accessible. So in another project um, that they're for funded uh, called the Catchment Management and Modeling Platform, a whole series of uh, a huge number of over 100 data sets were made available and also uh, models of which Lucy is one. Now there's no website per se to go and get it, but it does have a link where you can go and basically contact the developer and, and she will make it available. So Lucy is coming away. It's always one version behind where um, the, develop, the, the development team is doing, but yes, Lucy is becoming freely available. And I do need to check out whether on the CAMP platform, it's C-A-M-M-P, um, it, it is there already, but that's certainly one of the models that is being made available on there. And thank you, Bridget. True, you're changing the way biodiversity is defined. Um, there's a lot of information that can be sort of gleaned from looking at this, but one of the things I want to show you is the data sources behind it all. So looking at an individual data set like the Ladybird data set, if you click on the information eye on the left-hand side of any one of these things, the tab for data sources opens up. And there's a text box here that tells you the rationale, why we're using total species richness from biological records, why that's good for biodiversity, how we actually construct it. And more importantly, at the bottom, it tells you what the data set is, the reference to the data set, the year they were collected spatial scale. So everything that you end up doing in this map in terms of trying to come up with a set of outcomes is traceable back to the to the original data sets that go into it. 
And in the, in the data archive, the printed data archive that we have, we actually have more information about each of these data sets than we display interactively right here. So that's a main part of what we're trying to do is maintain this sort of a, um, transparency and openness that we're doing. The little map to the right here is a map just of that single database. So if we're looking at the, the ladybirds from the biological record dimension, this is how they're distributed. So by comparing that to the overall economic, environmental, and social outcome on the left, you can begin to see if, uh, whether or not if you're really concerned only about ladybirds, your high priority areas down by London are not being represented on this other map at all. So it's, this is one of the main things about the interactivity of the map that we're trying to promote is that it, it generates this kind of, uh, of discussion. Um, Back to the indicator weights, uh, as you start playing with different indicators on these scales, let me just close this up a second. As you start playing with these, uh, this map up here at the top, this sort of a um, pie chart, uh, is color-coded. So uh, environmental data are green, like this green column. The blue are the social data, like this one. The red are the economic data over here. And the different pie slices on here are the different definitions of what goes into that. So, any particular place, we see that the current map as it's set up, the social weight in the blue bar up here at the top, the social weight's about 30% of the weight. Uh, we're looking at direct employment, that's about 0.04 in terms of overall average weight, and creation of jobs is uh, about half of contributing to about half of that. So this indicator weights page lets you sort of see what's going on. Over at the other side here, these are the particular outcomes um, that are coming to the top given the weights that you've put in here. So at the moment, uh, the most important in terms of the largest weight for outcomes uh, is avoiding waste. That's come to the top. It's an economic condition. Uh, if we turned off the economic weights altogether, so we don't care about economic at all, you can see something else. So now public health has come to the top in terms of the current set of remaining weights. Public health is perhaps the most important consideration in producing this map over here. Um, this is for the outcomes themselves. Uh, and these are for the individual um, definitions. So public health is here, but the single database that's contributing the most is, is accessible green space. That's part of the definition of public health. But you can see that the flood map is coming up to the top also. The flood data set is coming to the top, even though there's no direct uh, environmental data set over here. Um, this is the thing that's really interesting about just this linear combination of data. When you start playing with this, the kinds of uh, coincidences of occurrence and the kinds of trade-offs that you weren't aware of or potential win-wins that you are aware of. So a lot of time in working with people is spent just browsing through the different combinations on this uh, model. Now, as you can imagine, after 15 minutes of playing with this, you get really tired unless there's a particular question your teacher sent you to go away and come back with an answer. So um, part of the whole idea behind this demonstration and the question that came up earlier about do farmers actually use this tool? I think they are very engaged and interested at the beginning in understanding how the national scale is set up. Once they start drilling in on this map over here trying to find their farm, there's a little bit of information in the square in which their farm is about the current set of weights of saying that environmental in this case is the most important bit of what's going on. But then they'll go farther and try to find their farm within that square, and that's when these smaller scale tools start to come into play. Uh, so there's a, there's a range of things that can be done uh, looking at this in terms of understanding how the databases relate to each other. Uh, we'll point out also that the clustering, uh, as I mentioned earlier also, there is a clustering routine on the map. Um, and basically, you can select a number of clusters uh, by sliding this bar at the top. So as you go to more and more clusters, um, basically, if we map those clusters, what we're trying to do now, this is no longer the, the average outcome. Each color on here represents a cluster of data that has similar characteristics to other blue areas on the map. If you highlight any one of these, cluster five, those are on the left, again, the squares on the map that are part of cluster five. And looking at the information being displayed, cluster five is predominantly a social cluster. It's considering social data sets primarily with environmental and economic views about equal and weight in terms of what's going on. If you look at this one, this is one that's predominantly dominated by economics, um, being the red bar being the highest, and you can see the location of the, the clusters in that particular case. So this is only for the outcomes now. This is not for the final um, recommended uh, sustainable intensification priorities. This is just understanding what's contributing to 
the kinds of outcomes you're trying to protect when you go decide what you're going to do locally. So the clustering algorithm at the moment is a pretty simple one. It's linear. As with all of the stuff in the tool, you can begin to sort of change these things. You can add more complexity or less. But what we're really trying to do is explore patterns and come up with something that makes a coherent sense. And one of the concerns, actually, that was expressed in our workshops is once people had played with this for a little bit and realized the complexity of what was behind it, we said, yeah, it is. It's a very complex question you're asking. How do economic, social, and environmental values, how do we preserve those if we're going to intensify our production? And just with the data sets we were able to bring together and put in in the first couple of years of the project, there's a huge amount of complexity that's brought into this. Um, so having some sort of way of trying to express this and simplify it and visualize it, we find it to be really useful, not only in, in, in maybe reaching some final decision, but, but in, in, in generating dialogue, as I've said a couple of times before. And the question I always used to ask at the end of one of the workshops, okay, somebody's going to draw a map and push a button and say this is what the policies will be for the next 10 years. It's no better or no worse than currently the way we do try to consider all available information and what's going on. One advantage of this whole approach that we've adopted from SIP is that there's an evidence trail behind this. If you take clusters off of this map as a, as a reason for or a pattern to develop policy or locally within your own catchment scenarios to start certain local management plans, the reasons, the data sets, and the value or preference that you've placed on those data sets are documented within the tool. So everybody's understand, they should be able to understand exactly how you've gotten to that decision point. And I, I didn't mention it throughout. I think early on, we called this thing, maybe in one of my first two or three slides, we were about generating a decision support tool. And that's the important part here. It's a support tool, not a decision-making tool. And as a support tool, it's meant to be used and abused perhaps at times to times. So um, anyway, we encourage you to give it a try and see if you find utility. And we're always open to, um, we're always open to uh, trying to improve this. Hello, did I just turn myself off? Okay, I'm good. One last thing just to show, uh, there are no more questions coming, so I'm going to do one last thing. At the moment, uh, if you look across the top of the page uh, in, the, in the IRL bar at the top, uh, that actually is a code that represents exactly where each one of the weights on each one of the data sets are set for this particular look. So you can, you can set something up, you can then clip that line and send it to anybody else using the tool. They can paste it in and the map will come up just like you're looking at as well. So this is another bit of record keeping that we have. So you, you know, by the time you spent a half an hour and you move this, that, and the other, trying to record how each position of each slider is can be somewhat overwhelming. But the following, the bar at the top is sort of doing a running uh, monitor of where you are. So I think there are no more questions. Um, yeah, okay. 